Today we're going to have a very good panel discussion, pro and against crypto, and I'm excited to hear both sides, although I'm obviously in one of them. And I'll, uh, we're going to have the wonderful Natalie Brunel from Coin Stories. It's an incredible podcast, and you can see her on Making the Rounds on TV now, Fox News, um, and others. So Natalie is going to uh, host and moderate the debate, and I'll uh, hand it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm super grateful for OKX bringing us all out to this beautiful historic Bank of New York building for a debate. The bull versus the bear in Bitcoin. I'm going to pretend you guys don't know my side on this. I'm going to put my neutral journalist cap on uh, and we're going to get going. All right, so I want to introduce, first of all, on the bull side, Chris Berniski, co-founder of Placeholder VC and co-author of the book Crypto Assets the Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. Prior to Placeholder, he pioneered ARK Investments Management Next Generation Internet Strategy, leading the firm to become the first public fund manager to invest in Bitcoin. If you're bullish on Bitcoin, you probably know Kathy Wood, so welcome Chris Berniski. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And ooh, the bear. The bears are, you know, shorting Bitcoin right now. All right, David Wu. David Wu is the CEO. <laughs> this is going to be a great debate. This is what strengthens our conviction, guys. All right, David Wu is the CEO of David Wu Unbound. He's held major leadership roles at Bank of America, Barclays, City, and the IMF. He was trained in Wall Street. He really knows how the sausage is made. And he was named one of the 12 smartest people on Wall Street by Business Insider. So, David Wu, on the bear side. <laughs> All right, guys, um, let's kick this off with a little bit of what you've both said about Bitcoin. So, David, in 2013, you gave Bitcoin, or excuse me, David, in, in 2013, you gave Bitcoin what was considered to be one of its biggest endorsements. You were one of the first people on television being bullish on Bitcoin very, very early. And at the time, you talked about its potential for growth while you were a leader at Bank of America and Merrill Lynch. But you've since changed your position, going so far to say that Bitcoin is a joke. Chris, in 2015, you set a new precedent by making ARK the first public fund manager to invest in Bitcoin, but you advocated for it as a global payment layer. Now you've changed your view, you believe it to be more of a store of value. So my question for you both is, why is the belief that you've formed right and why is your opponent wrong? Why is Bitcoin a joke? And why is it a good store of value or not? We'll start with you, David. What, am I supposed to defend it as a store of value? No, you're going to say why it's wrong. Say no, why your position is right and I why think, that's First wrong. of all, I think in 2013, I was convinced, okay? And by the way, you know, I, you know, you could watch me. I was on TV with Alan Greenspan. He said Bitcoin was worthless. I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Greenspan, you're completely wrong. Because at the time, I felt very strongly, like Chris did, that Bitcoin was going to be a major challenge to the payment system as we know it. As you know, you know, the payment system is one of the most lucrative, okay, essentially business for banks without doing very much, just to transfer your money basically from one pocket to another, they fleece you. <laughs> That's like a riskless transaction just because they dominate the whole system. They get to charge you basically a transfer fee. And I thought Bitcoin was really going to give banks a run for its money. And this is why I was super optimistic about Bitcoin. But thanks to Bitcoin, banks spent the last 10 years trying to overhaul the entire payment system. Today, you can transfer money to another person just with his email address through Zelle. Costs you zero. It takes five seconds, faster than basically Bitcoin. So in that sense, Bitcoin has played an extremely productive role in terms of forcing banks to get off their ass and make changes. So in that sense, you know, Bitcoin has benefited humanity in that sense. So yes, I think Bitcoin from that point has played a very useful role. As a store of value, that's a different story. Personally, I think, you know, as a store of value, listen, unless if, if you think everything's a store of value, it's fine. I mean, listen, for me, I don't need Bitcoin to become, let's put it this way. Bitcoin is not investable or not investable because it's going to replace the dollars of reserve currency. That's a very high hurdle. <laughs> you know, why do you need to basically apply such high hurdle to Bitcoin? Why does Bitcoin have to solve all the social evils in the world 
in order for you to want to buy it. You know what? You know, you might make me a price, I'll sell you these sneakers. Because you know what? Everything has a value. And everything doesn't have to be the best and the greatest in the world to have value. So we have to differentiate between the greatest and the best in something that has some value. And I think that is very important. So for me, Bitcoin is a trade, just like this basically pair of sneakers. It doesn't have to be the best and greatest, and it will have its moment in the sun. Not right now, maybe in six months' time. We'll talk about that later. All right, we will talk about it. And by the way, for the record, David does not currently have Bitcoin, right? No, I don't. Does not, but did hold it. And thank you for keeping to the two minutes, because I didn't mention also, you both have two minutes each to answer your questions, so I'll be keeping time as best I can. All right, Chris, your response. He might hold Bitcoin in six months, though. <laughs> I might. <laughs> you might, right? You might, that's fair. You might hold it. He's All waiting right, for it to go to 10K, so, all right. So I think to define Bitcoin as a store of value requires defining a store of value in the first place. And so I would think of a store of value as something that has a float that's not undergoing excessive supply inflation, such that if you own a percentage of it, you're not getting overly diluted. And then commensurate with that, you need demand to be keeping up with whatever the supply inflation is, such that your purchasing power is roughly equivalent over time or goes up over time um, in, in the best of cases. And so there's no doubt that Bitcoin's super volatile, which often leads people to say it's not at all a store of value. Um, but you have to take a longer term view because it is a growth asset, right? And so it goes through periods of very much being priced as a growth asset. And then it also goes through some periods where it's treated more as a risk off asset. Um, and, and really what I think it comes down to is actually Bitcoin's conservatism. So it's the asset that changes the least of any asset in the world, right? It's, it's set in digital stone. And that conservatism um, really means Bitcoin serves as a type of mirror for society and the markets. And it reflects the, the liquidity of the markets and it reflects the craziness of society. So Bitcoin's only a joke insofar as the markets and society are a joke, which I could probably agree with in some um, grand poetic sense. But um, Bitcoin is really just there to reflect what we as a society do and what markets do. And I'll tr also say the excesses of, of the excesses of central banks. And so as liquidity is sloshing into the system, Bitcoin as a sponge grows bigger. When liquidity is being drawn out of the system, as it is currently, Bitcoin shrinks. And it it's, can be thought of as simply as that. Oh, that was two minutes exact. Wow, that was pretty impressive. Uh, well, let's run with a couple of those thoughts because a lot of people were hoping that Bitcoin would be an inflation hedge. And arguably, it's really benefited from the last... 12 years of QE. It's basically only existed in a quantitative easing environment and benefited from all the liquidity and easy money in the system. So do you believe that Bitcoin will eventually decouple, decorrelate from risk on assets? If so, why? And if, if not, why not? David? I think not. And I'll tell you why Bitcoin is doing so poorly this year. And I think, you know, let's just be very honest. I mean, you don't have to be bearish or bullish. You need to understand why Bitcoin is doing badly, because there's a reason for it. You know, the same reason why tech stocks are doing poorly. And why is tech stocks and Bitcoin both doing poorly? Because think about this, Bitcoin pays you nothing. I mean, there's no interest, there's no coupon, okay? And if tech stocks, the earnings that they promise you is in a very distant future, <laughs> all right? So what that means is that in very simple financial terms is that when we value an asset today, you take its future cash flows and you discount it into today's value using some kind of maybe you know, interest rates. Usually we use a 10-year U.S. government bond yield as a discount rate to discount future cash flows into today. When U.S. bond yield was close to trading at zero, <laughs> you know what? If you have no earnings in the next five years but you have a lot of earnings in the future, guess what? Your company is going to be worth a lot. Even though Bitcoin pay you nothing, when U.S. interest rates were zero, guess what? You don't mind paying, basically buying Bitcoin. So from that point of view, there is no doubt. There is no question. The reason why both Bitcoin and tech stocks are struggling this year is because all of a sudden the Federal Reserve is having to raise interest rates to counter inflation. Now, guess what? You can thank Joe Biden for it because by 
embarking on the most unprecedented sanctions against Russia. In fact, I would argue the U.S. provoked Russia into invading Ukraine. We can talk about this because what you don't know is about what the neocons have been doing. Because of that, in energy prices gone through the roof, food prices gone through the roof, poor people being impoverished, in inflation's gone up, and then guess what? The Federal Reserve is now having to raise interest rates. And then that is killing tech stocks, and that is killing Bitcoin. So from that point of view, what I'm telling you is we have to understand my job is as an analyst. At the end of the day, I don't care if something's going to go up or go down. And then if you want to invest anything, whether it's my shoes or basically Bitcoin, you have to understand the drivers. You have to understand why is it trading the way it's trading right now. And I'm just telling you right now, the reason why Bitcoin is doing poorly is because inflation is making a comeback. Now, you might say, is inflation going to be here to stay? <laughs> right? Because let me tell you. <laughs> Right now, the inflation in the U.S. is 8.5%. If U.S. inflation remains at 8.5% for another two years, I can guarantee you Fed funds rate is going to 8%. If Fed funds rate goes to 8%, do you think Bitcoin is going to go up or go down? You know what? If you basic inflation goes to 8.5%, that means every seven years, your deposit is going to double. <laughs> it used to be the case. That's how people used to save money. When inflation was high, interest was high, if inflation is 7%, you're gonna, your, your money is going to double every 10 years. You don't need to work that hard anymore to basically invest your money. So what I'm telling you is that this is why the biggest driver, in my view, for Bitcoin right now is inflation. And for those of you who are bullish, you better hope that inflation is going to be yesterday's story. But let me tell you, this is where it gets also fascinating. Because you know what? You know what caused inflation to go down for the last 20 years? Because all the goddamn outsourcing to China, all the globalization, okay? You move all the jobs to China, there's deflation, and the Fed brings the interest rate down to zero. Now Joe Biden wants to put sanctions on China. We're forcing our companies to pull back. You're going to be paying more for your iPhones. But inflation is going to be higher. Interest rate is going to be higher. Guess what? That's not good for Bitcoin. <laughs> if you think otherwise, if this war in Ukraine is going to last for the next basically five years, that's not good for Bitcoin. We can give you many different situations, but I can also imagine a scenario which could be, could be good for Bitcoin, but that will come back to another second. But the point is that what you need to understand is what is driving Bitcoin? What are the factors? What is sort of the, because Bitcoin is not just some kind of magical thing that's going to go up because we have all these social problems, income inequality, and this is going to be somehow solved or social evils. That's true. But that's just basically false hope. We now know, the great thing about 2022, we now know how Bitcoin is trading. This is why institutional investors are taking interest in Bitcoin. Because finally, there's a pattern in the way it's behaving. And that's fantastic. And now we can tell stories that make sense. All right, David, I let you go a little long, but that was very, very interesting. We're going to go back to some of it. I know behind, behind the scenes, we were talking a little bit about how with inflation hedges, we want to zoom out, right? That's what my argument is always, zoom out. So counter arguments to, uh, to Chris now is Bitcoin an inflation hedge and can it decouple from these other risk on assets in this environment? So I don't think in Bitcoin's current state that I expect it to decouple from risk on assets um, because Bitcoin is a growth asset, right? Um, it's, it's a decentralized information network in its earlier years. And so, um, because of that, as David's pointing out, it's very sensitive to interest rates, right? Now, value stocks become less sensitive to in interest rates because their cash flows are pulled closer to the present. And so the conversation starts to get really interesting when Bitcoin is more at maturity, say in 10 or 20 years. How is Bitcoin going to be behaving? Um, and my expectation is at that later date, which Bitcoin is growing to, right? Last year's the First year that Bitcoin crossed a trillion, it currently sits at 300 billion. When I started covering it for Kathy, it was at 3 billion, right, um, at, as a total network. And that was in 2015. So from 2015 to 22, has Bitcoin going 100x protected you against inflation? It definitely has. Um, and, and, and it's done multiples of that. I think over the next 10 years, if you look at if you sat in cash versus if you sat in Bitcoin, I think that you will increase your purchasing power by just purely holding Bitcoin and potentially finding ways to earn yield in Bitcoin um, over the next 10 years. That's not to say, though, that in the short to medium term, 
holding Bitcoin isn't a painful trade. Um, and anyone who, who follows me publicly knows that um, from the end of last year, I've been cautionary on the markets. Um, you know, the uh, cocktail that we find ourselves in is not one that's good for risk on assets. And all of crypto is the riskiest market that's available to men. All right. Well, you're absolutely right. And people who uh, people who purchase Bitcoin at sixty thousand are probably not happy with any of the Bitcoin bulls right now. But um, some of the analysts that I talk to on my podcast, they're predicting the Fed to be as aggressive as possible for as long as possible, and that we might be entering from a secular bull market that we've had for pretty much the last 40 years into a secular bear market and a lot of pain ahead as this sort of deleveraging happens and maybe some misallocations and some malinvestments get unwound. So if we enter into a bear market that is sustained, we have sustained high interest rates for as long as we can, although some argue we, we really can't go that far with all the debt, how will Bitcoin perform in a sustained secular bear market? So let's just think about valuation, okay? I can tell you, as of right now, this moment, the interest rate market is pricing the terminal Fed funds rate to be at 4.5 percent. What I mean, what I mean by that terminal Fed funds rate is what the market is pricing in terms of where the Fed funds rate is going to be when the Fed stops basically hiking rates, 4.5 percent. Now, I think 4.5 percent is fair because I, I I struggle to see U.S. economy still doing okay at 4.5 percent because there's a lot of debt in the system. I mean, already mortgage rates, as you know, it's, it's just over 6 percent. Housing, housing, home sales yesterday was a terrible number. Like, you know, yeah, housing is not such a big deal for the economy anymore, but it's still big enough that if housing completely crashes, like, we're going to have a recession. So I think 4.5 percent is fair. Now, the fact that 4.5 percent is fair in terms of what the market is pricing for the terminal five funds rate doesn't mean that all other markets are also fairly priced. In my view, the U.S. stock market is still way too expensive. I'll tell you, it's very, it's very simple. Right now, the 12-month forward earning yields on S&P 500 is about 5.8 percent. So how do I basically calculate? I take consensus estimates for S&P earnings over the next 12 months. I divide it by the price. So it's the inverted P.E. Right? That's the sort of the equivalent of the, so we can translate into a yield, basically the equivalent. 5.8%, if you ask me, it's pretty low. <laughs> I can tell you, like, you know, 2008, last time we were in a recession, it was like 9%. Okay, if we get to 9%, S&P has to fall another 30%. You know, in 2020, when we had a recession because of COVID, you know, earning yields, basically S&P went to 7.5%. <laughs> Even in 2011, when we had the, you know, after the midterm election, we had the debt ceiling crisis, we got to 7.5%. So when I look at recessions over the last 20 years, earning yields, S&P 500 is a lot higher than what it's now. The only way we're going to get there is if stock price would fall. Because there's no doubt earnings are going to get downward estimated. So my view is that stocks are going to fall. Now, I think when stocks fall, because we're going to a recession, because I'll tell you, like the war in Ukraine, you don't know it yet, but let me tell you that this is going to change your life, my life, and the world in such an unforgettable way that this a week is something you're going to remember when Putin just basically declared he's mobilizing essentially the 300,000 reservists in Russia. This is the first time since the end of the Second World War. This is open war. And this is a war against the United States. I have no illusion about this. But, okay, let me start. I'm telling you, recession is around the corner. Stocks are going to fall. When stocks fall, Bitcoin is going to follow because that's what it is. Like, you know what? Because earning yields is the same thing. So basically, given Bitcoin's beta, that's why I think 10,000, to me, is going to be the first level that I will live with. I, I will start looking at 10,000 as an interesting entry level because also remember something else. People tend to think, you guys think, oh, wow, Bitcoin is decentralized. Let's get the Wall Street guys out. Bitcoin, remember, how many people, what percentage of Bitcoin holding is held by the top 100 holders? You don't want to know the numbers. It's a very high number. If you're talking about concentration of holdings of Bitcoin, I don't think there's another asset except maybe some really esoteric asset where you have a few people holding so many of them. And when you have so many people, so few people holding so many of them, this is when manipulation becomes very easy, by the way. 
I've, did, I've did foreign exchange for a very long time, and there was, a, and foreign exchange is a three trillion dollar daily or turnover market. And there was a time there was a lot of manipulation. And let me tell you the way Bitcoin is trading, the way it came up, four thousand and down, three thousand go nowhere, and then down twenty thousand. You don't, aren't you looking at that? Say, well, that's kind of strange. Especially, you know what? I'll tell you something else you can look at. To me, it was very interesting. You, if you look at the way it trades, you can even do the math yourself. It would be like, it goes down <laughs> during intraday, goes to below 20,000. And at the end of the trading day, somebody somehow magically it bids up. It's as though somebody doesn't want it to go below 40,000, below 30,000, below 10,000. Because guess what? When you have a few people who own a lot of this stuff, <laughs> okay, and they can move the market, and then they don't want to see the technical collapse of Bitcoin. They have an interest to get together and try to defend it. Now, the suckers who are there are saying, oh, wow, this looks pretty good. Looks very, very strong resistance support level. You know what? That's where you get fucked. So from that point of view, this is, right, why, this is why to me, 10,000, we're going to go. Because I think the way it's trading right now, these guys won't be able to hold on much longer. All right. Well, David's a buyer at 10,000. As a trader, he's adding to the volatility. Luckily, there's two people on every side of the trade, so we do find a little bit of a support level here. Uh, Chris, I want you to, the chance to, to, to give a rebuttal. Sure. So Bitcoin at 10,000 for me is a garden variety bear market that I've been, to, been through multiple times over. That would basically be Bitcoin down 85% from its highs, which, um, which is what 2014 and 15 was. Um, which is what 18 and 19 was. Um, off the bottom in 14 and 15, we 100 x um, Off the bottom in 18, 19, we over 20 x I'd anticipate off of this bottom, we at least 10 x So that's Bitcoin at 100K, call it by the middle of this decade, assuming that we don't go into a prolonged um, and secular bear market. I think that there's enough innovation and change going on in our world um, which uh, leads to increasing unit volumes um, and enough enthusiasm from the consumer. And that's also juiced by a move into the digital age where units can be produced at zero marginal cost, which is good for the profitability of companies, um, such that while I do expect pain through this year and into next year, I don't expect that this is a lost decade. Um, I also expect the growth rates in crypto to continue to be the fastest growth rates in the world, um, which they have been for a while now. And um, Bitcoin is also a beneficiary to a lot of the innovation going on within the Ethereum landscape, within the Solana landscape, the Cosmos landscape. Um, and as this um, fixed supply asset, um, and Dan and I were talking earlier about BTC as a type of pristine collateral. Um, it's, it's an amazing collateral that it's not a liability. It's not someone else's liability. Um, it's a true bearer asset, and that is useful within these other systems that are being created. Um, and so my expectation is I, I can totally see B BTC 10K. I can see BTC 14K. Um, it wouldn't bother me. And um, I can also see BTC at 100K by the middle of the decade. All right. Well. Given what you said about pristine collateral, a lot of people also feel that it's not only institutional grade, but reserve asset grade. So reserve assets are defined as being readily transferable assets used to balance international transactions and payments. And we're seeing a lot of countries de-dollarize right now, right, and change up their FX reserves. So gold is currently the third largest reserve asset in the world. Can Bitcoin compete with and ultimately replace gold on a macro scale, gold being $10 trillion market cap? I'll start with you, Chris. Sure. So I see Bitcoin as superior than gold in pretty much every way other than gold's commodity use cases. Um, it's more scarce, it's more transportable, it's more divisible. Um, it, is digital gold, um, and it's superior in every way. And I also think that the characteristics that proof of work give Bitcoin make it really interesting for energy-rich countries, either in their natural resources or sun or wind-powered as those economics come down. Also, if you look at some renewable energy installations, those installations they struggle with um, their, their capacity to store energy because consumers are very boom-bust in how they consume energy, 
but a lot of those installations will produce energy um, and then need to store it. And batteries are expensive, and Bitcoin in this context can be thought of as a type of economic battery that um, those renewable en energy installations um, can pump their energy into mining BTC, which if it makes them more profitable, increases their investment, which generally society needs more and more energy over time. The reason I'm mentioning this in the context of re reserve asset status is it gives nations a way, especially energy rich nations, a way to accumulate BTC um, on balance sheet without necessarily having to struggle with other flows of foreign assets. Um, and I also think that we're not that far off from a major uh, nation state player putting BTC on their balance sheet really as a um, strike against USD, right? Um, it, it, it is a new type um, of, of digital asset and I think it's a apolitical um, statement that um, certain nations would would like how, um, j how say how it rattles other nations in power, the foremost of them being the United States. Well, a lot of nation states are already considering Bitcoin, including uh, everyone, President Nayib Bukele here from uh, El Salvador. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, he's here in New York City, but not, not here tonight. Nervous right. silence. <laughs> yeah, no one was really excited about that. Are you guys all bear? All right. Did you see Biden? Corner, yeah, Biden's also here. He's, he wants to hear about Bitcoin. Uh, David, your rebuttal. Can Bitcoin yeah. be a reserve asset? Listen, I, you know, I, I, let's put it this way, okay? You know, the former French president, Charles de Gaulle, used to call a reserve currency as an exorbitant privilege. You can, you know, you understand, he, he was not a big fan of the United States. Okay, this is why, by the way, the impetus of the European Union, the Eurozone, was to create, you know, an economic bloc that can rival the U.S. so they can also have a reserve currency. Because, you know, it's a wonderful thing to have a reserve currency. When you have a reserve currency, it's like you can print all the money in the world. <laughs> the currency is not going to go down because it's going to be always people looking to buy your currency as long as it's reserve currency. Do you think the U.S. is going to give up? <laughs> the U.S. dollars reserve currency status. I can tell you, you think about it. Right now, Biden said, well, you know, I'm 60 minutes. You heard, right? He said that he would be willing to send U.S. troops into Taiwan to defend a Chinese invasion. He said, well, China's dictatorship violates human rights. If you ask yourself, China today, you know, the last 20 years, until basically two years ago, the United States looked upon China as our best friend. All the U.S. companies were outsourcing to China. This is the biggest market in the world. Do you think China was any less, basically, uh, less brutal towards its own people? Arguably, probably China is less brutal today than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But that didn't stop America's basically pouring to China. Why is it all of a sudden the U.S. is declaring war on China? Because China's about to overtake the U.S. as the biggest fucking economy in the world, and the RMB could potentially, very soon, challenge the U.S. reserve currency status. And now the U.S. is announcing all these sanctions against China, that these guys abuse human rights, we're going to basically bring them down the peg. Now, if they did that to China, surely you don't think they won't have the means or the will to do this to Bitcoin, do you? Do you really believe that any governments are going to allow Bitcoin to seriously challenge fiat currencies? If, you know, this is, to me, this is the biggest, biggest contradiction in the Bitcoin community. You're buying Bitcoin because you say, oh, wow, U.S. is running unsustainable deficit. They're printing money like mad. I got it. The only way I can escape is buying Bitcoin. But let me tell you this. The day comes that U.S. Treasury is running out of money. <laughs> They're coming for you big time. And I'll tell you, you might think that is a joke. But let me tell you that it is no joke. And I'll give you two reasons for it. First of all, you understand, Bitcoin, you know, everything's got its Achilles heel. Bitcoin's biggest Achilles heel is that it needs oxygen to live. The oxygen is called Bitcoin exchanges. The only way for Bitcoin to trade, have any value at all, is like, you know what, you're able to transact Bitcoin, buying it against dollar, selling against euro, buying against Japanese yen, these exchanges. Do you know governments can shut down these exchanges tomorrow 
in 24 hours if they want to. They've done that in Russia, they've done that in China. China used to be the biggest Bitcoin market. In one day, the Chinese say, enough, that's it. There no more Bitcoin trading the next day. If they kill exchanges, there'll be no more Bitcoin. You're only going to be able to transfer wallets from one person. There wouldn't be, the value is going to collapse because you wouldn't be able to pay anything. Also remember, the IRS just announced they are now hiring 87,000 inspectors and auditors. You think you're going to get away with that so easily? They're coming for you. When governments run out of money, they're coming for you. And the easiest thing to track is Bitcoin because everything's on the goddamn blockchain. So the strength that you love so much about Bitcoin is going to be its biggest weakness. These fucking two guys, the, the couple, stole $7 billion. They transferred this money, creating all these basic accounts here and there. They got basically discovered. You think the CIA can get to you? Or the FBI cannot get to you? With 78,000 auditors? This is what I'm telling you. If you think that Bitcoin is going to give you the refuge when government's coming for you, <laughs> Think again, because, because Bitcoin depends so much on exchanges, you have no place to hide. And let me tell you another reason why you should right, be wary about what soon, the government. Wrap soon, David. What? Wrap soon. Fine. I'll tell you, China. China is about to issue their own central bank reserve currency, which you might have heard about, which is going to control everything. Yeah, I tell you, in a central bank company, I used to work at an international monetary fund. I used to go around, traveling around the world, giving advice to countries about how to manage the reserves. I can tell you that much. I can tell you central banks are like basically teenagers. They follow herds. Now that China is going to basically launch their own digital currency, the U.S. cannot be left behind. This is why all of us in Jenna Yellen is talking about we need to have our own digital currency as well so not to be left behind. The day U.S. has own digital currency is the day Bitcoin is over. <laughs> because or Biden would not want competition for the U.S. own national digital currency. Can you believe it? Or the day Bitcoin moons, potentially. I think both of us, everybody on stage here is bearish on CBDCs. Uh, I'll put a bow on this topic with the fact that our own Federal Reserve Chair, Jerome Powell, said there can be multiple reserve currencies. And uh, as far as the exchanges being closed and the IRS, everyone's in a loss right now, so no one has to pay capital gains this year. No worries. All right. I'm going to have you both switch, switch caps for a second. You're going to be the bull. You're going to be the bear. So, Chris, what are the vulnerabilities of Bitcoin? So, definitely the transparency, um, and that also strikes at BTC's fungibility. Um, th that's a key. I do agree that exchanges are a weakness, though I would counter that with exchanges exist in ge different geographies, and different geographies have different strategic interests, and so not all exchanges would be shut down globally at the same point or moment in time. Um, but transparency, um, the, the exchanges, in some ways, Bitcoin's high denomination, so like the fact that it's 20,000 units, um, we refer to it in the crypto industry as the unit bias, right? Why, why do crypto people love Ripple or Shiba Inu or Doge? Because you can buy, you know, a million of them for $1,000, whereas you spend $1,000 and you get 1 20th of a BTC. Um, and so for that, the community has d d discussed denominating it in, you know, millibits or different denominations that are smaller, such that, you know, you start buying, you know, a thousand millibits, for example, with a thousand dollars. I have a hard time arguing against BTC, but I would say that the, um, the core thing that I do worry about is the transparency. Um, and I do complement Bitcoin with Zcash um, because Zcash uh, employs zero knowledge proofs. And the whole point of cryptography um, is to collapse the cost of defense um, such that it doesn't matter how many resources the attacker has, the sovereign individual can defend their wealth. Um, and I think that um, David should probably study more on zero knowledge proofs because it will change the game. Um, and these ledgers will be able to verify the truth while not revealing the contents. Um, and that's gonna make things really in interesting between the individual and the nation state. Um, but Bitcoin does have to keep an eye on its transparency and its fungibility. Fair. Well, David, the bullish case for Bitcoin, what are Bitcoin's strengths? 
Listen, there is definitely a bullish case. <laughs> And I want to tell you this, and, and, and this is why I'm telling you, I'm, I definitely will be looking to buy 10,000. So this is, again, I don't need Bitcoin to become the greatest and best, but I think its moment in the sun could be actually 2023. And you might disagree with me completely about my reasoning, but I'm going to tell this to you anyway. And the reason I'm going to tell, you, tell this to you anyway is because, you know, until 12 months ago, I ran the number one, you know, basically ranked macro strategy team on Wall Street. I left it because in order to basically share with people like you what I know. Because I think Wall Street has gone much too far. There's a monopoly in terms of the creation and delivery of content. And I want to break that. Okay. So let me tell you what I think could be the, could be the moment in the sun for Bitcoin. Let me tell you a number. 95. Okay. Now, as you know, the, the midterm elections in the United States it's going to be in November 8th. It's, you know, we're talking about less than two months from now. Normally, midterm election in the U.S. is like a yawn for Wall Street. But this time, I personally think it's going to be a trading opportunity. And let me explain to you why, regardless which party you might identify with. In case you don't know, Donald Trump has endorsed 300 Republican candidates who are running in various offices in this midterm elections, local, state, and federal. You won't read this in the New York Times, but you can check my number. 95% of these 300 people who have Trump's endorsement have won their primary elections. Now, let me tell you what these people have in common. They just have one thing in common. They all want to investigate the 2020 elections. And moreover, they want to impeach Trump for Hunter Biden's basically, mis basically misdoing. So now, that's fact number one. I'm just telling you, you know, a lot of Republicans who are running for office, they all want to investigate the 2020 election. And if they do that, we're talking about civil war. You certainly we're going to see, like, real serious problem in this country. Fact number two. If you go to realclearpolitics.com right now, you'll find that all the generic congressional polls currently have the Democrats leading the Republicans by five points. I can't stop laughing when I see those numbers. Let me tell you why you can look me up. One of my claims to fame, other than I was the first analyst to initiate coverage on Bitcoin 10 years ago, I was the only analyst on Wall Street who correctly predicted Trump's victory in 2016. Now, in 2016, I can tell you the polls were wrong because too many people who were going to vote for Trump, they were too embarrassed to admit that they were going to vote for Trump. But let me tell you today, Nobody's embarrassed to admit they're going to vote for Trump, but they're goddamn scared to admit that they're going to vote for Trump. After what Biden said about like all the MAGA people are basically semi-fascists, I can tell you not a single serious Republican, if he gets a phone call from CNN saying, oh, well, by the way, conducting a survey about the U.S. midterm election, he's just going to hang up because he's worried whatever he's going to say is going to be held against him. So I think the polls in this country right now are massively underserving Trump supporters. And by the way, MAGA is not 10% of, of Republicans. It's 80% of the Republican Party, in case you don't know. You probably don't know this because you live in New York and you're young. You're probably Democrats. But the point here is this. So the scenario that will be super bullish for Bitcoin, but you won't like it so much because you're a Democrat, is that if we get a red wave in November, that we send all these pro-Trump people to Washington, they all want to investigate the 2020 elections, and they all want to impeach Biden, and then they find, basically, the, they get to the bottom over the Hunter Biden business, and then California say, we want to get out. New York say, we want to get out. If U.S. starts to disintegrate, that is so bullish for Bitcoin, it's going to 100,000. It's going to millions, <laughs> by the way. So, I hope your politics are aligned with your pockets. <laughs> because this is one golden opportunity, and I don't say this lightly, because for the first time, you need to realize this is America's, the dollar's biggest problem is the US itself. Because the war in Ukraine is very bullish for the dollar, very bearish for Ukraine, I just told you. Because this war in Ukraine is gonna kill Europe. If it kills Europe, it's gonna kill the Euro. If the Euro goes down, you know what? Nothing is going to challenge the U.S. dollar. The dollar is going to be king, and Bitcoin is going to be in the gutter. However, the only thing that can do the dollar in 
is if the U.S. were to break up. And maybe it's hard time we go there. Something will make a lot of you guys very happy. So now think whether your politics are aligned with your pocketbooks. All right, David, even when you're bullish, you're bearish. Uh, oh, no, I'm one very of the, bullish. <laughs> one of the, to 10, 10 million. Well, one of the things people love about Bitcoin is it's apolitical. Something that you said, uh, and I'm going to kind of round this out for the last question. Something that you said I related to, because when we were talking about the 2016 election, I was a reporter back then, and I saw the country dividing more and more and more. And I think everyone in this room can admit that we're in a place, we're in a point of history where people are so polarized, so frustrated, and they're looking for not only someone to blame, but someone to save them. So my question to you guys is, I think we can all agree that the system is broken. It's one of the reasons why you left what you were doing. It's one of the reasons you're in crypto. The system currently as it stands is broken. It advantages a few people at the expense of everyone else. It doesn't allow us to plan for the future. It doesn't allow for young people to get a seat at the table and be able to plan and, and have assets the way that their parents once did. So if not Bitcoin, what? what is the solution? I want you to respond to that sentiment. If not Bitcoin, then what? Sure. I, I would go, um, I guess I would go with crypto broadly um, because Bitcoin is a subset of, of crypto. Um, you can say Bitcoin, by the way. You can say if it, it is no, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the answer. <laughs> no, because, I mean, Bitcoin gave, gave birth to blockchains, um, which are this new accounting fabric for society that also allows, if, if you account for the rules and assets of society um, in an open way that everyone can validate and accept and trust, um, then you can also coordinate society differently. And what you're talking about is a breakdown in society's ability to coordinate because we don't trust the system, we don't trust each other. Um, and so if we're able to come back together and agree, say, on the core resources and the rules around those resources of society um, and, and the institutions that maintain, say, those resources and actually guide those institutions more directly, then our coordination can improve. Um, and so there's a lot of work going on to this end within some of the other ecosystems that I mentioned like Ethereum and Cosmos and Solana. Um, the, the buzzword would be de decentralized autonomous organizations, but I really just see it as digital organizations um, that, that are playing with these forms of organization um, as society has always played with forms of organization. I think one of the things that we're going through right now is our, our institutions are old. Um, if you read Carlotta P Perez in her book, Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, she talks about with every new technology paradigm, you need new institutions that are native to that paradigm. And we live in a digital paradigm, but our institutions were born in buildings like this. Um, our politicians were born in buildings like this and operate in buildings like this and move slowly and, you know, by and large are too old to connect with what's needed. And so we need new institutions um, that are governed by new blood. And I think that you can't reform an old broken system as easily as you can allow a new system to grow up alongside it. Um, and with, with blockchain as the accounting and or blockchains as the accounting and organizational fabric, I think that's our best bet. All right. David, if not Bitcoin, then what? Listen, first of all, I, I'm a, like everybody else here. You know, human progress is driven by innovation in technological progress. Now, this is why you all love Bitcoin. You think, well, it's a technological miracle. But technologies are supposed to make our lives better. Just think about the telephone. Okay, they both communicate. It's a huge productivity gains. The PCs, okay? It used to be like, you know, you guys, most of you guys are too young to remember this. When I was working at the International Monetary Fund in the year 1995, I think there was one secretary per economist now, before I left Bank of America, one secretary was servicing 50 basically strategists on the trading floor. That's productivity gains. Now, now you ask yourself, has Bitcoin improved the life of anybody <laughs> in the world since its inception in the last 10 years? The answer is no. I'm sorry to say this. 
Okay? Yeah, indirectly, it probably made our traditional payment system a bit more efficient, but it has not made anybody better because it has not produced anything. Because usually, technological breakthrough, whether it's PC revolution, telephone, airplanes, they produce something. Bitcoin hasn't produced anything. Well, now, so therefore, for me, Bitcoin is not, the technology here is not, I, I agree something to do with technology, but in my humble opinion, and I'm gonna make myself extremely unpopular here, you can throw things at me, which is fine, okay? I believe, and I strongly believe this, like, like you, I mean, this is the reason why I walk away from Wall Street, because I just can't stand the income inequality, the stupid policies that make this country basically going into the gutter, right? I think good policies is what we need. Now, what is good policy? Again, you're gonna hate me for this, I don't care for Donald Trump as a character. I think Trump's policy was very good. By the way, income inequality in this country fell every year for the four years he was in there. I'll give you an example. People say, oh, wow, the corporate tax cut was a disaster. It benefited the corporations. But do you know the following? Because U.S., by the way, because U.S. had very high corporate tax rate, U.S. companies, <laughs> at the first opportunity, they move all their factories abroad. So that, and then they kept all their profit abroad. So for the last 15 years, until Trump came along, US companies invested everywhere else except here in the United States. The reason why standard of living for 15 years went nowhere under Clinton, under Obama, under Bush, was because US companies were minting money in the business that they were making outside, and they didn't bring that money home because they didn't want to pay US taxes. Until Trump came along and said, now we're gonna bring our tax rate to the level of the international norm. By the way, the corporate tax rate that Trump basically brought down to was between Spain and Netherlands. It's right in the middle of the pact. And then Trump says, I'm gonna bring down the tax rate for you, but in exchange, you better stop bringing the money back, otherwise we're gonna tax you to death. As a result, in the next two years, we saw booming investment in the United States. And finally, we saw black unemployment rate, Hispanic unemployment, the lowest level ever in history. By the way, people don't realize this. Do you know in 2020 elections, Trump picked up 15% more Hispanic votes than he did in 2016? All right, wrap, David. But the point here is this. We need good policies. Good policies are pragmatic policy. Good policy is make China play by the rules so that they're playing by the same rules as the United States. Good policy is not to say, we're gonna, we're gonna basically impoverish China, we're gonna not import anything from them, we're gonna apply sanctions on them. That is not the way to go. We wanna look for win-win basically outcome. But the way we're going about right now, we're digging our own graves. And then for that reason, we're gonna be digging the graves of Bitcoin too. All right, David Wu, Chris Berniski, I really appreciate the chance to talk to both of you. I think we can all agree that for many people, we know we need to fix the monetary system. Maybe we look at things a different way, but a lot of people have hope that it can improve, and hope is a motivating factor in economics. And so I want to thank both of you. The thank bull, you. the bear. I tried to stay neutral. I hope you couldn't tell how much I was more on this side. But uh, thank you so much for coming, and thank you, OKX, for putting this on. Thanks, everyone.